Brandon, thank you for leading us in that beautiful song and for all of our songs this morning. And thank you for participating in such a marvelous way. Thank you, Jim, for your prayer this morning and Kim for those wonderful thoughts as we gathered around the table, focused upon the promises of God. How grateful we are for your remarks today. How do children describe love? I was reading an article this past week that reported on a survey in which a number of children ages four through eight have been asked to define the word love. Rebecca, age eight, said love is when my grandma became uh, too sore with arthritis to bend over to paint her toenails. So my grandpa started painting them for her. Even though he has arthritis in his hands. Billy, age four, said, when someone loves you, they say your name differently. Your name is safe in their mouth. Danny, age seven, said, love is when my mama makes coffee for my daddy and takes a sip of it first to make sure it's okay. Emily, age eight, said, love is when people kiss all the time and then they talk and then they kiss some more. My mama and daddy are like that. I think they're gross. And then Bobby, age seven, said, love is what you feel on Christmas when all of the gifts have been opened and you just stop and listen. That's pretty perceptive. Well, how would you define love? I looked in a dictionary this week and saw several definitions. One said that love is an intense feeling of great affection. Another said that love is a special interest in or pleasure with something or someone. We know that psychologists tell us that the ability to give and receive love is one of the most basic human needs. Fifty years ago, there was a popular movie entitled Love Story with a famous line that said, love is never having to say you're sorry. But I think I like this definition that was given by an old man out in the country way back in the hills and hollers of Arkansas, when somebody asked him, sir, what is love? And he pushed his old straw hat back on his head and said, love is a funny thing. It's almost like a lizard. It curls up round your heart and jumps into your gizzard. Well, the subject that we're considering throughout this fall semester is what does Jesus say? And so I want to ask the question this morning, what does Jesus say about love? The word love, our English word love, appears 66 times in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 39 of those times are found in the Gospel of John alone. And when Jesus talked about love, he used it in several contexts. For instance, Jesus talked about the love that God has for you and for me. In the crown jewel verse in all the Bible, in my opinion, John 3, verse 16, Jesus says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. Now we may quote that verse, that by our mere familiarity with it, we lose some of its significance. But may I suggest to you that everything in the Old Testament points to that verse. And everything in the remainder of the New Testament points back to that one verse of Scripture. That's why I call it the crown jewel of the Bible. But not only did Jesus talk about God's love for us, he also spoke of the Father's love for him. Later in John 3, verse 35, Jesus said, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. And then in John 5, verse 20, he says, The Father loves the Son and has shown him all things that he is doing. And he shall do much greater than these, so that you may marvel. The Gospels tell us that Jesus loved his disciples. In John 11, verse 4, John notes that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And later in that chapter, as Jesus stood at the tomb of Lazarus, John 11, verse 35, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. But do you know what the next verse says? Verse 36 says that as the people looked at Jesus, they said, Behold how he loved him. In John 13, verse 1, as Jesus began his final discourse with his disciples, recorded in John chapters 13 through 16, John says, Jesus having loved his disciples, he loved them to the end. What does that mean? It means he loved them to the uttermost. He loved them to the uttermost. And in John 15 verse 9, Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Now, when we talk about what Jesus says about love, I think we can divide it down into three very essential components. The greatest command, the last command, and the most difficult command. So let's talk first of all about the greatest command. Let me ask you, if you had an opportunity to interview Jesus, what would you ask him? Well, that's exactly what happened to a group of Pharisees in Matthew 22, beginning with verse 34. This group of Pharisees came to Jesus asking him questions, only their motives were not pure, as I believe yours would be, because they wanted to test him. Now, William Barclay, in his commentary on the Gospel of Mark, says that whenever a Jewish rabbi wanted to comment upon scripture he would do one of two things first of all he would either amplify it by adding oral tradition or secondly he would seek to condense it into as few a words as possible and so one of these jewish teachers of the law says to jesus what is the greatest command expound upon it jesus or condense it for us. Let us know what is the greatest command. You remember what Jesus said, don't you? In verse 37, he says, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and great command. And the second is likened to it. Love your neighbor as yourself. For on these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. Now when Jesus made this statement, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, he was quoting from the Jewish Shema found in Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. That word Shema means to hear or to understand. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and mind. And that's exactly what Jesus quoted. Love God with all of your heart. The heart is the seat of the emotions, the seat of human feeling. Don't ever let anybody tell you that religion doesn't consist of feeling, for it does. The heart is the seat of the emotion and the feeling. But not only the heart, but also the soul. The Greek word, it's suke, meaning life. Life, that inner being that gives life to this fleshly body. Love God with all of your life and with all of your mind, your intellect, your will. Faith does not require you to check your mind at the door. Rather, faith is an examination of evidence and a conclusion that is based upon that evidence. Hebrews 11 verse 1, wherefore faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. That's the greatest command. Many years ago, Tammy and I lived along with our four children in uh, the central part of Tennessee, Middle Tennessee as it's known. I was in graduate school at Lipscomb and uh, while I was in school, I was preaching for a congregation in a very small little Tennessee town. And we had a lady in that congregation who's just one of my favorite people in the whole world. Her name was Elverna Griner. We called her Pete. That's what everybody called her. Pete. Pete loved her. Pete was a University of Tennessee Volunteers, Big Orange, fan to the max. Now to all of you Razorback fans, I'm sorry, but I've got to use the balls for this illustration. She had been a season ticket holder for 31 straight years, along with her husband, until he had passed away. And then she just continued that tradition. Well, every year that we lived there, and we were there about six years, every year we lived there, Pete would take Tammy and me for a football weekend to Knoxville. We would normally go around the first part of November, so it was always either Tennessee, Kentucky, Dennis, uh, Fant, I know you're a big Kentucky fan, it was always either Tennessee, Kentucky, or Tennessee, Vanderbilt normally were the games. One year we saw Tennessee, Miami. But um, we would get there on Friday night, since it was November, basketball season was starting up, and we would go to a ball game at Thompson Bowling Arena. And then on Saturday we would get up and we would drive as close as we could get, and then we would walk a mile or more to the stadium. And when we got to the stadium, we would climb the stairs, and Pete was in her 70s by this time, but we just trucked up those stairs with her trying to keep up. And when we got to the seats that she had had for years, we were allotted about this much room to sit. I'm serious. And if you've ever been in a crowded football stadium like Nayland Stadium, 100,000 people packing that place in pre-COVID days, we had about this much room, and some of those people were just rude. They got up and came in and out and in and out, and they never did say, how you doing? Welcome, we're glad you're here. The bench was made out of aluminum. Sometimes in November, it would be a nice, warm, sunny day, but I remember there was one game we went to it was cold, rainy, and fog. We couldn't even see the players on the field. And we sat for four hours. Four hours! And we kept coming back. Why? Because we loved it. We enjoyed it.
enjoyed it. I have to wonder about our spiritual priorities in life when we complain when we go over an hour at church. Or we say, why do you expect us back on Sunday night? You're going to do the same thing you did Sunday morning. You ever been to a baseball doubleheader? You ever notice they do the same thing the second game they do the first? Why is it we complain about things spiritually, but my friend, when it comes to ball games and athletics and other things, we are gung-ho and ready to do it. Folks, it is a matter of priority. The greatest command, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, and your mind. Now, notice what Jesus says about the last command. Did you know the command to love is the last command Jesus gave? I'm talking about prior to his death, burial, and resurrection. There was one command he gave after his resurrection. We call that the Great Commission, and I'm going to talk about that in about three weeks. But before his death, burial, and resurrection, the last command Jesus gave is found in John 13, verses 34 and 35 where he says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also should love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. Jesus had just finished washing the feet of his disciples in an act of deep humility, and servanthood. And now he tells them it is by loving one another that all men will know you are my followers. I think it's extremely interesting to notice the correlation between the Gospel of John and the letters that John wrote later in the New Testament, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. John, who is often called the Apostle of Love, obviously picked up upon what Jesus was saying because when he wrote the letter 1 John, his first letter, in 1 John 4 verses 20 and 21, he says, if a man loves, says he loves God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For how can a man love of God whom he has not seen? if he does not love his brother whom he has seen. Notice what John's saying. John is saying, if you want your vertical relationship with God to be right, then your horizontal relationship with your fellow man must also be right. And by the way, the opposite is true as well. If you want your relationship with others to be right, your relationship with God needs to be right. I was watching a documentary on TV just a couple of weeks ago that focused upon the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. It dawned on me suddenly that some of you who are younger and students may not even have been alive on September 11, 2001, and some of you were extremely young. But this particular documentary dealt with United Flight 93, which was the flight from New York, Newark, New Jersey International. As it was flying across Pennsylvania, four Al-Qaeda terrorists armed with knives, box cutters, killed the crew, and took control of the aircraft. They forced all of the passengers to the back of the plane. The passengers began planning to seize control of the plane from the terrorists. 
But before Todd Beamer and the other passengers set out for the cockpit armed with pots of boiling, scalding water, they began taking their cell phones and calling home. There's a museum there in southwest Pennsylvania where Flight 93 crashed. And in that museum, there are recordings of some of the phone calls that were made that day. What do you suppose they said? Did they say, hi, honey, sorry, forgot to take out the trash. Would you do it for me? No. Did they say, hi, sweetheart, be sure and pay the electric bill? No. Every one of them said the same thing. We've been hijacked. It doesn't look good. I love you. I love you. Why are we so reluctant in the church to tell each other that? Would you, would you explain that to me? Why are we so reluctant? We tell each other everything else about the weather and sports. And why are we so reluctant to simply say, I love you? Jesus said that's the mark that his disciples would be identified by. Third, Jesus says that love is the most difficult command. In Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, beginning in verse 43, Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemies, but I say unto you, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven who makes the sun shine upon the evil and the good and the rain to fall upon the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love only those who love you, what good does it do? Do not even the tax gatherers do the same? And if you show respect and love only for those who respect and love you, do not even the pagans do the same thing? If you are living a Christian life, you are going to be hated. I'm more convinced of that than ever. If you are living for Christ, there are going to be people who hate you. Jesus said earlier in Matthew 5, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely on my account. Paul would write to, th to, to uh, Timothy, all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. How are you going to respond to the people who hate you because of your faith? Are you going to respond with hate? Or will you respond with love? On one occasion, General Robert E. Lee was asked his opinion of a fellow general, a General Whiting, and Lee began to speak of him in favorable terms. Lee's aide pulled him aside and said, General, are you not aware that General Whiting has been extremely harsh and critical of you? And Lee said, yes. But the question was, what was my opinion of General Whiting, not what was his opinion of me? About the same time, an aide to President Lincoln, pulled him aside one day and said, Mr. President, you're too kind to your enemies. You should seek to destroy your enemies. 
and not befriend them. Lincoln, with his characteristic grin, said, Am I not destroying an enemy when I make them my friend? I don't know how many sermons I've preached on the subject of love over the years. There have been a lot. It's one of my favorite subjects to preach about. But I'm convinced this morning as I speak to those of you in this building, perhaps some over in the annex this morning, and those of you who are watching online either now or who will be watching this message in the days to come, I do not believe I have ever preached on the subject of love in a more critical time than we are facing right now in our culture. Never has our need to love God been greater. Never has our need to love one another been stronger. And never has our need to love those who are our enemies been more pertinent than it is right now. So I want to challenge you, church, to follow what Jesus said about love. It is the greatest command, the last command, and the most difficult command. But it's what Jesus said. Now this morning, have you accepted Christ into your heart and your life through faith? Have you turned away from sin to follow him? And have you been buried with Christ in baptism so that you might be raised to walk in newness of life? If you haven't done that, May I invite you to do that today. Everything's ready. We'll, we'll practice social distancing as we need to, but everything's ready. And if you have questions, we'd love to visit and talk. You'll be treated with respect and love. Come right now while we stand, while we sing.